starts at 10 p.m. Eastern on Primetime Live. The Black Sky event will be the topic. It is an actual military operation covertly been done, just like Jade Helm and uh, Operation Gotham Shield. Matter of fact, I have a uh, confidential letter, never been released, some of the information in it. I've released some of the information, but not all of it. And so tonight I will, because it obviously is confirming the Black Sky event. The Black Sky event is the federal government preparing for a widespread power outage across the country. Now, this event is scheduled for two days after the solar eclipse. The solar eclipse, of course, will take place on August 21st. But on August 23rd, this federal government agencies, and it's a lot of them, working in, con, uh, uh, in tandem together, they're preparing for a, the possibility of a widespread power outage across the United States as a result of the Black Sky event that could bring society to its knees. Now, we know Alex Jones has already talked about this on InfoWars and others on the uh, conservative alternative media has also addressed it. But I'm going to address it tonight because I have information, inside information, that I think can help us see why they're going to do what they're going to do. Now, will they do a widespread power outage? No, I don't think so. I think there might be some periodical ones, just like there was helicopters in New York City and, and frogmen dropping out of the sky, just like there were uh, and paratroopers, just like there was the uh, Jade Helm and military operations that just kept showing up. Just remember when all of those... Um, uh, armored vehicles just kept showing up, one in every little town across the country. I mean, I just kept finding them. It's the same kind of deal. This is uh, Operation Gotham Shield, Operation uh, Jade Helm. This is, uh, of course, the Black Sky event, a uh, exercise that is absolutely being done by FEMA, the U.S. Department of Energy, the, the U.S. Uh, Depart Homeland Security, uh, and others some of the cyber ter terrorism groups, the CIA, and others. And some of the uh, groups that are off the books, uh, you know, kind of the, the black, black ops that are off the books. So all of them are going to work in tandem on how to handle a catastrophic, cataclysmic black sky event. If a massive power outage, if the power grids of half this nation went down, how would you handle it? We're going to watch and see how this plays out and keep your eyes open for the 23rd of August. There may be a massive power outage in one or two cities across America, just maybe for temporarily for a few hours, just to see how this operation would work. We're going to watch and see. I'll talk about it tonight and read from the letter I have and give you my full detail uh, tonight. 10 p.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Eastern, along with all the current world events, and uh, biblical prophecy and just where we are in these last days. I'll see you guys tonight. Prime Time Live, 10 p.m. Eastern, on my website at paulbegleyprophecy.com. Also, if you got the Paul Begley Prophecy app, download it on your phone for free. It's at the Google Play Store and the, and the Apple Store, okay? Uh, I'll be live on Blog Talk Radio. No, I won't. I, I already did that today, okay? I'll be live on New Live Stream. I'll be live on Roku Satellite. We'll be live on Periscope. We'll be live on YouTube. We'll be live on uh, publiclyprophecy.com. And the archives will also be available in just about every one of those locations. So I'll see you guys tonight, 10 p.m. Eastern, the Black Sky event. In Montana. Now, keep in mind this video. I know it doesn't look terribly impressive, but this is in Helena, which is a little over 30 miles from where the epicenter of this uh, earthquake was, which, by the way, was a 5.8 earthquake. And you've got to remember, you know, the person who took that video, they probably realized there was an earthquake happening. They had to take the time to take the phone out and then start filming, and it was still shaking at that time. So, pretty significant shaking. Um, I mentioned it was a 5.8 magnitude. This happened a little bit over 30 miles from Helena. The closest town was Lincoln, uh, Montana, which is a smaller town. Helena's got about 30,000 people or so. Lincoln has about 1,000 people. 
Lincoln is about six or seven miles from where the epicenter was. They did briefly lose some power in Lincoln. We also have had a report of a uh, gas leak in Helena. And to give you an idea, I mean, 5 to 5.9 is a pretty significant earthquake. I mean, if you're pretty close to the epicenter, that'll probably move some furniture and damage some walls. I wouldn't be surprised if we end up hearing about some reports of that in the Lincoln area. Of course, this uh, happened very, very early in the morning. It happened just after midnight mountain time uh, along the Lewis Range in the Rocky Mountains. Of course, there is a reason that the mountains are there in the first place, so you'd expect to see some seismic activity from time to time. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, the Philippines has been struck by a 6.5 magnitude earthquake. Officials said the natural disaster has killed at least one and has damaged several houses and other buildings. The center of the strong earthquake first hit in a magnitude of 6.9 near the center of Tacloban, but the towns of Jaro and Kanango were then hit by a 6.5 magnitude. No tsunami is expected to follow the earthquake, but there will be some strong aftershocks. Three days of heavy rain fed by Typhoon Nanmandol caused massive floods. Parts of the southern island of Kyushu were hit by nearly 600 millimeters of rain in just two days. That's nearly double the average in July. At least 500 people are believed to be stranded, cut off by floods and landslides. As the rain approached, 54,000 Japanese were evacuated from their homes. I see news about disasters on TV, but it's unbelievable that this has happened so close to us. It's really awful. This kind of disaster never happened around here. At least 12,000 emergency personnel are helping in the rescue and relief effort. Helicopters are essential because roads are cut and bridges washed away. More rain is expected on Saturday, but not as heavy. The government's warning residents to stay alert. The engagement of Japan's Princess Mako was supposed to take place here in Tokyo on Saturday. But because of these deadly floods in the south, it's been postponed. Bacteria at the beach. That's right. Summer rainstorms are really causing some big problems at swimming areas in Pinellas County. ABC Action News reporter Sarah Hollenbeck found out some people question whether the city of St. Pete is doing enough to warn everyone about what's in the water. Sometimes looks can be deceiving. The turquoise blue water at Spa Beach looks quite inviting. But today it's polluted with harmful bacteria. I wouldn't swim in it. And if you're not paying attention, you could walk right past these signs and jump in. It's even less obvious at Lassing Park, which is often shut down for bacteria. Here, just three signs dot the entire 14-acre waterfront. I've seen people walk right by it and not even realize it. Kathleen Turnis sometimes feels like she's on swim patrol, warning families of the danger lurking in the water. I don't know if you guys know this, but the water's like really bad shape right now. And they're like, oh, thank you, thank you. I mean, they were super grateful. The bacteria can make you sick. The rain washes dog and bird poop into the water, causing bacteria levels to spike. Today, five St. Pete swimming, boating, and fishing areas have advisories at Spa Beach, Fossil Park Lake, Salt Creek, Crisp Park, and the Broadwater South Canal. But we found plenty of people fishing, jet skiing, and swimming there. This should have signs all up and down the beach that everybody know not to get in the water. Especially if there's somebody already in there, you're not going to think twice about it. Freshwater drum and maybe stress related to spawning. Now there was concern the kill may be related to a chemical spill from Ford's nearby plant last month, but the Ohio EPA says the chemical was not toxic and unlikely to affect just one species like the drum. Now out live here is you see some of these fish that have wa uh, washed up on shore here at Sheffield Lake. The Ohio DNR says that in some of these cases the viral infections Infecting these fish may come and go very quickly as to not make a major dent in all the fish supply. Pei Yun shows us what's left of her family home, but she's soon overcome with emotion. Her 67-year-old mother-in-law was killed. Mud and water rushed into our house and my mother-in-law drowned. The water was at least waist deep. Heavy rain had brought down the hill next to the house. Other family members escaped, but they're now homeless, living temporarily with relatives. Three people lost their lives in Maolu village, killed in landslides caused by heavy rain. People here tell us it had been raining for several days before the slopes gave way. In this small community, every loss is keenly felt. At another home, 
a wake is being held for Huang Yulian. Her son tells us they needed to use two bulldozers working for three days to recover her body. I am very sad. This tragedy killed my mother and also her sister. Two days ago, I buried my aunt, and now I'm at my mother's funeral. The rains have stopped for now, allowing people to start the slow process of rebuilding. But it isn't just homes that need repairing. Crops and farmland have been destroyed. Many farmers here say their harvests this year have been wiped out. And with a month to go before the rainy season ends, it's still too early to count their losses. The severe weather moving in tonight just as we start the weekend. Already millions in the path of deadly storms from Kentucky to Pennsylvania. Wind gusts nearly 90 miles per hour blamed for killing a 72-year-old homeowner, knocking a large tree right onto his house in Grand Haven, Michigan. Flash flooding washing away streets and submerging cars in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Here's ABC's Gio Benitez now. Tonight, powerful storms racing east. Intense rain snarling New York's morning commute. Roadways flooded from New Jersey to Massachusetts. Some shut down. This is a major street here in New York City going right through Central Park, but today, nothing is going through here. Subway stations turned into waterfalls. This after more than 200 severe weather reports in the last 24 hours. Powerful winds slamming the Great Lakes region as the squall line moved through. It sounded like a jet engine. A jet plane was just parked on my deck. It was so loud. Gusts above 90 miles per hour in parts of West Michigan. A security camera catching a flying trampoline landing on a car. In Grand Haven, a 72-year-old man killed when a tree crashed onto a home. Those storms knocking out power for 140,000. And David, those storms brought torrential rain to New York City, falling at over an inch an hour, and they're firing up again from Pennsylvania to Kentucky. It's going to be a rough night, David. And we are following breaking news. This is Chopper 2 a short time ago over a reported explosion and ammonia leak in northwest suburban Elk Grove Village. You can see the damage at food manufacturer Grecian Delight at Tone Road and Chase Avenue. There is a large fire department presence on scene here. As you can tell, the building was evacuated. Several people filing out. This is just moments ago. And and right now, there are reports of one injury and several workers awaiting EMS evaluation. The total solar eclipse that we've been telling you so much about is just over six weeks away. Hotels in our area already sold out, and you can bet other businesses also have plans to make money on this big event. But you don't have to own a company to make your mark and a few bucks. The darkness to come is giving upstate entrepreneurs some bright ideas, whether they've been in business for 70 years. We'll definitely dazzle and amaze them with something fun. Or they just open shop. It's really just an exciting time. There's money to be made in the first transcontinental total solar eclipse in 99 years. So we're charging $100 for the eclipse, which is double our normal price. Emily Dowling raising the rate for her Airbnb in Greenville to match demand. But that's just the start. As far as our designs for the solar eclipse, we're still working on them, ironing them out. She plans to sell Eclipse attire through her newly launched website, Drifted Earth, which connects people with iconic local outdoor spots. I think it's so cool that for this event, I get to be right here in South Carolina, which is the most perfect place to see the solar eclipse. Blue Jar Barn and Belton offering up an eclipse group wedding for the big day. They're going to say their vows all at one time, and we hope to finish right at the exact time of the eclipse. Even the post office is getting in on the action with these solar eclipse stamps. Black when it's cool, but if you apply the heat of your thumb or just use the hot Carolina temperatures, and all of a sudden, the moon is revealed. Some of the goods still under wraps. It's kind of top secret right now with our decorators. But by the time the eclipse hits August 21st, you won't be able to avoid all the marketing. No matter, it's something you won't see again in these parts until 2078. Can a global coffee chain promote the global fight for LGBT rights? This Muslim leader says not in Malaysia. Our objection is because they're promoting something that's against human instinct, against human behavior, and against religion. That's why we're against it. Muslim leaders in Malaysia now calling for a boycott of Starbucks and for its operating license to be revoked. The grievance new, even if it dates back to pro-gay rights comments that are four years old from Starbucks chairman and former CEO Howard Schultz now circulating online. I'm Muslim, but this is actually um, a global issue. 
don't make it such an issue that um, we have to boycott such a company because of one small statement. There's the same boycott call in Indonesia and a relaxed attitude from some customers. Personally, I don't have any problems whether or not they support LGBT rights. I love their products, not the CEO. But others less so. This Jakarta resident says she supports the ban. While LGBT activists say recent years have seen a spike in intolerance in both Malaysia, where Islam is the official religion, and Indonesia, the country with the largest Muslim population in the world. Now to the mid-air brawl in first class involving a Tampa man who's in jail tonight after allegedly punching a flight attendant during a Delta flight from Seattle to Beijing. Passengers jumping to the rescue and the pilot declaring an emergency. And tonight we've learned what that Tampa man was actually trying to do. Tonight, the trashed cabin and federal charges after violence breaks out in the air 45 minutes into the Delta flight to Beijing. It's going down in here. They're taking some guy out of the security. Everybody's filming. They get wild. In court today, 23 year old Joseph Hudik from Tampa allegedly tried to open the exit door in first class. A flight attendant stepping in and the man allegedly punching her twice in the face. The real hero, I think, was the uh, flight attendant. He was quite violent. Other passengers jump in, then the flight attendant grabs two wine bottles to hit the suspect in the head. One of the bottles breaks over his head, but witnesses tonight say it didn't even phase him, yelling out at one point, do you know who I am? The amount of bruising and blood on the, uh, on the passengers who helped and the, and the poor flight attendant, it was a pretty serious incident. Finally, passengers and the flight attendants were able to restrain Hudik long enough to put zip tie handcuffs on him, but he remained extremely combative all the way back to Seattle and needed to be restrained by multiple passengers until the Delta flight landed. Delta 129 was first. We're coming back. Wild flight to say the least. The flight attendant and the passenger both taken to the hospital with non life threatening injuries. Hudik was arrested. He now faces up to 20 years in prison. The U.S. sends a message to North Korea. A pair of U.S. Air Force B-1 bombers on a special mission tonight, taking them on a flight from Guam to the Korean Peninsula. The two B-1 special mission took them close to the Korean DMZ, where they dropped dummy bombs on a target in a show of force and in a show of solidarity. They're being escorted by South Korean fighter jets. Flights like these are known in the Air Force as jungle lightning flights. The flight comes just days after North Korea raised the stakes, successfully launching an intercontinental ballistic missile, flying 1,700 miles into space, which could bring Alaska into its crosshairs. Now, the launch of, is a violation of existing U.N. sanctions against North Korea, and it follows a string of launches of smaller missiles in May and June and at least two nuclear weapon tests last year. The U.S. and South Korea answered the North Korean launch with a joint fire exercise and a show of solidarity. Joining us now on the phone is Fox Pentagon producer Lucas Tomlinson. Lucas, what more can you tell us about this special mission tonight? Well, Jackie, uh, you know, these flights are not exactly routine, but they do happen. As you mentioned, they have a name, Jungle Lightning. They fly from Guam 2,000 miles up to the Korean Peninsula, and that's each way. Uh, the B-1 is the largest bomber, conventional bomber in the U.S. Air Force arsenal, carries more payload than anything. It's a supersonic bomber. It means it can fly over Mark, Mach 1. Uh, it's against ISIS, has had devastating impact. Just a handful of B-1s flying about 2% of all the missions in Iraq and Syria dropped over 40% of the bombs. So it's a heck of a show of force for North Korea. When uh, Secretary Maz says there's military options in place, uh, following the short-range surface-to-surface missile drill after North Korea fired its intercontinental ballistic missile. This is now the second show of force by the U.S. military demonstrating what the U.S. Air Force can do, and that's flying these long-range missions. Uh, and these B-1s can stay up in the air upwards of 10 hours at a time and can carry a payload uh, that it would take 40 attack jets to carry the same amount of bombs as uh, a single B-1 bomber. And the, the other interesting part here is that South Korea, they are escorting uh, this B-1 bomber, which is interesting to see that they are now back, back behind us on this. And, you know, it's really a whole world. It's a worldwide um, issue that everyone should be concerned about, but we were being escorted by them. How important is that tonight? 
Well, it's very important. Secretary Mattis, the Pentagon, talks about, frequently about allies in the region. Uh, it's very noteworthy that Secretary Mattis, days after taking the reins as the head of the Pentagon, head of the military, traveled to the region. He traveled to Asia. He flew to Seoul. He also flew to Tokyo. It's noteworthy that before this mission today, yesterday, a pair of B-1 bombers flew with Japanese counterparts. So here we are, back-to-back -back days, these B-1s flying out of Guam, uh, thousands of miles away, and flying with not only South Korean partners, but also Japanese partners. There's about uh, 80,000 U.S. troops between South Korea and Japan on the ground, and you also have a lot of interoperability as demonstrated by these flights with the South Koreans and Japanese. So uh, the Pentagon will tell you it's not just the U.S. military out there, but uh, there's a lot of uh, mm -hmm. alliances in the, in the region. Reuters has reported that French police evicted thousands of migrants living on sidewalks in an area of northern Paris as dawn broke on Friday. Many of them people who fled war or strife in countries as far away as Sudan, Eritrea, and Afghanistan. Dozens of police and white police vans moved in at around 5 a.m. to clear the area where Paris City Hall official Dominique Versini said numbers have swollen to between 2,000 and 2,500 people. Versini told CNews TV that about 100 a day were arriving in the area called the Porte de la Chapelle in the north of Paris, noting that many came from Eastern Africa as well as the Middle East. The migrants were being escorted onto buses to be taken to temporary lodgings, such as gymnasium buildings in Paris and areas ringing the capital. Live TV footage showed what appeared to be a peaceful evacuation. The President Trump impersonators march onto a beach in Australia. The impersonators carried the new Australian flag on Tuesday. They were protesting the president's decision to withdraw the United States from the Paris Climate Agreement. They then staged a mock news conference before the Donalds pretended to be swept away by massive waves. Protests break out overnight in Hamburg, Germany. And more protests are expected today as President Trump meets with other world leaders at the G20 summit. I'm a news reporter, Trang Dell is live now in the CBS3 News Center with more on this G20 summit. Trang, good morning. Well, good morning, Rahel and Jim. These meetings will include President Trump's first face-to-face -face with Russian President Vladimir Putin today. But the talks will overall will be likely dominated by North Korea's latest missile test. Protesters armed with objects and paint clash with police and riot gear on the streets of Hamburg as the German city prepares to host leaders from the world's largest economies for the G20 summit. Some 100,000 anti-capitalist protesters are expected Friday and Saturday, setting fire to several cars after officers use water cannons, pepper spray and batons to subdue the early crowds. Meanwhile, President Trump met with German Chancellor Angela Merkel Thursday. North Korea's intercontinental ballistic missile test, the focus of the conversation. Earlier, the president told a welcoming crowd in Poland that he is considering serious action. I don't like to talk about what I have planned, but I have some pretty severe things that we're thinking about. He's also slated to meet with the leaders of South Korea and Japan on the issue. But all eyes will be focused on planned talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin. They will meet for the first time today after trading barbs in the media. Putin pending an op-ed in a German newspaper questioning Trump's trade policies, following the U.S. president's strongest public criticism of Russia to date. We urge Russia to cease its destabilizing activities in Ukraine, and elsewhere. The highly anticipated meeting is expected to last a half hour. The White House confirms Syria and ISIS will be part of the discussion. But what's not likely? Any talk of Russian meddling in the 2016 election.